federal government and organized labor agree on 70,000 Naira new minimum wage. Education Minister insists that from next year, students eligible for JAM should be 18 years and above. Members of the House of Representatives offer 50% of six-month salary as palliatives for Nigerians. And a good morning, Nigeria. Today, our focus is on bridging the gaps in the, in the health sector. And so we are back to discussing our healthcare sector, which appears to be currently facing many, many issues. Statistics would indicate and quite unacceptable healthcare indicators, despite several efforts at improving them. Maternal mortality ratio stands at 814 per 100,000. That's <laughs> depressing. Well, mortality rate for infants and children under five years is 70 and 104 per 1,000 live births, respectively. You know, you, you, you said depressing, and in, indeed, that's, uh, that really captures it because uh, we seem to be rolling back, you know, significant progress uh, made under the MDGs and even just before. Uh, the successor SDGs uh, in terms of maternal, you know, and infant mortality rate ratios. Uh, Nigeria had really, really, you know, uh, made significant improvements. But uh, this latest statistics is quite depressing, uh, Henry. And key players in Nigeria's health sector are also raising the alarm and demanding prompt action to address uh, the gaps. Now, one of such uh, group that is, you know, championing the. Um, uh, 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 this movement is the Nigerian Medical Association NME. I mean, understandably so. Uh, they've raised concerns over the, what they call a worsening doctor to patient ratio in the country, and we all know why. Hmm. This is even more shocking because the ratio which NME pegged uh, at about uh, 1,000 patients to one doctor is uh, less than the World Health Organization's recommendation. Actually, it's 10,000 patients to one doctor. 10,000? Yes. So what really is the problem? And uh, uh, you may, as just as uh, Emre and I are wondering why the ratio uh, has gone uh, so, so, so depressingly high. And um, many, of course, uh, I mean, the first uh, uh, thing to point accusing fingers would be what you call the Jackba syndrome, uh, you know, which kind of uh, drains a medical professional or draws a medical professional from out of the country. But that has been happening. It's just that it got that momentum, you know, a few years back. And uh, we are also talking about medical tourism, which has continued to you know, happen despite, you know, all, uh, uh, you know, all efforts to address it. You know. Well, um, you know, thinking about this uh, it gives uh, concerns and uh, reason to worry because um, at the moment, uh, a lot of people are finding it difficult to feed well. Mm. Um, you know, sanitation is poor. Um, a lot of other issues that would, of course, result uh, to ill health. Mm. And then in the health sector, you do not have doctors to attend to you. So, I mean, what, what, what does all this lead to? Of course, the expectancy, life expectancy rate of the Nigerian well, well. would drop. Now, talking about the Jaguar syndrome, it's been on for a while, like you pointed out. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the moment, health officials are seeking homegrown solutions to the problem. Now, and this is in line. Uh, of course, in addition with the exodus of pharmaceutical uh, companies, uh, from the country. You know, uh, it, it should be good to really seek homegrown solutions, you know, 
to all the value chains and the medical, uh, you know, healthcare delivery, uh, because um, the, the the challenge or the gap is not just uh, the widening ratio, you know, uh, between doctor patient. The current high cost of medicine is also alarming, and it's a situation that the National Assembly and other groups have tried to address over time. A lot of people who use, you know, medications are complaining they cannot, you know, afford to you know, purchase their drugs. So homegrown solution is definitely a must, but we must also address other issues in Ray. Yeah, other issues, of course, infrastructure uh, gaps, ignorance on the part of patients, uh, poorly mm. trained personnel are also other challenges in the country's health sector. Mm. All right. There are suggestions that, for instance, that health care uh, can be made a national priority to enable Nigeria adequately represent reposition that sector. Well, um, it has always been a national priority. Uh, maybe we should say uh, there should be some more political will, you know, on the part of our healthcare managers. Um, and also, um, you know, the private sector as well, uh, because the private sector are also contributing their own quota. So maybe there should be, uh, apart from political will, there should also be uh, what we call collaboration between the private sector and the public sector, because the public, the pr public, uh, private sector do have a lot of resources, you know, to manage healthcare. Just that it could be quite expensive to access. But in mm. all of this, the big issue is where do we begin? What really are the major problems that we need to tackle to be able to bridge the gaps in healthcare delivery? in Nigeria and our guests hopefully will be joining us all the way uh, from different parts of the country and outside the country to you know share some experiences with us and that will be very very shortly let me welcome you once again all of you you're watching from different places I cannot name all of you that have called or you know costed us to say look we watch Good Morning Nigeria every morning because we get some very very vital information so thank you for making this program uh your morning tonic and uh, today's edition is the last for the week we are so excited it's friday i am claire adilabu abdurez like i don't know about henry <laughs> All right, you already mentioned my name, uh, so uh, I'm Ian John. But you know, uh, talking about uh, the health sector, you talked about it being a national priority. A lot of people would disagree with you uh, because uh, the budgetary allocation for the health sector uh, still falls short of the Abuja Declaration, which is supposed to be around 15 percent. So all of these issues, you know, we'll be looking at, uh, you know, uh, this morning, and we hope that uh, from this discussion, we will begin to see a change because this is. Uh, very important. And then the statistics for uh, uh, maternal and child uh, uh, mortality. Mortality, mortality is something that really needs to be addressed. And this is something even primary health care centers, you know, could help uh, in reducing. All right. So you want to stay put and watch Good Morning Nigeria all through. I will be here from now till nine. I'm Ian Ray John, like Claire said. <laughs> uh, Not and, like uh, I said. That's her name. <laughs> That's right. who she is. Uh, all right. And uh, of course, uh, Chikudu Kolugwaja will join us uh, in the course of the program for newspaper review. And uh, I'm sure um, our newscaster is still Musa Abubakar. Uh, he's going to be taking the news highlights. Musa, has the name changed? Good morning no, to you. Same old name. <laughs> <laughs> well, good morning, Yuri. And good morning, uh, Claire. The protracted uh, disagreement over the prospective minimum wage has finally been put to rest. As federal government and the organized labor unions agreed on a new minimum wage of 70,000 naira. The parties reached this agreement at the meeting chaired by President Bola Tinubu at the State House. And organized labor have agreed on a, an increase on the 62,000 Naira minimum wage. We are taking this uh, well with mixed feeling because of the situation of the economy, but we have to move ahead. for the break in that uh, transmission. But we return back uh, to Musa Abubakar for the continuation of the highlights of the morning news. Musa, sorry for that interruption. Thank you, Claire. 
Well, meanwhile, stakeholders on the platform of the Governing or Progressives Congress, APC, have described the planned nationwide protest by some faceless Nigerians as an attempt to undermine the nation's sovereignty and plunge the economy into disarray. Director General of the Confederation of APC Support Groups makes the position of other support groups known during a media briefing. It's painful memory. Therefore, we should not indulge ourselves in an untimely protest that has the potential and, and attraction of being hijacked by hoodlums, political jobbers, and losers. Meanwhile, President Bola Tinubu is calling for the enhancement of the economic value of bilateral relations between Nigeria and partner nations. A statement by the Presidential Advisor on Media and Publicity, Ajuri Ngilali, indicates that the President made the call when he received letters of credence from the new ambassadors of Portugal, uh, George Adao Martins dos Santos, that of Vietnam, Biu Kwak Hong, and Kuwait, Salim Khalifa Mohammed Al Muzayen, at the Presidential Villa. The president expressed his appreciation for Nigeria's long-standing relations with Portugal and shared interests in the areas of trade and culture, as well as partnership in oil and gas, which has translated into gains for both countries in his response. The ambassador of uh, Portugal said investors from his country have keen interest in Nigeria and that the trade with Nigeria on gas predated the war between Russia and Ukraine and will be sustained. In his meeting with the ambassador of Vietnam, President Tinubu says the manufacturing sector in Nigeria is ready to benefit from the automating skills and technology of the Asian country. In another meeting, President Tinubu thanked the ambassador of Kuwait for his country's long-standing good relations with Nigeria and extended his appreciation to Emir and Crown Prince. The new envoys were received with guard of honor mounted by presidential guards brigade lawmakers in the house of representatives have passed a resolution to slash their salaries by 50 percent for six months to provide soccer for nigerians and avert a planned nationwide protest over economic hardship deputy speaker benjamin kalu moved a motion at the plenary appealing to the proponents to be patient with the Tinubu administration. One another and let us walk hand in hand towards a brighter tomorrow. From 2025, any candidate below the age of 18 will not be admitted into any tertiary institution in, the, in Nigeria. Minister of Education, Professor Tahir Mamman, stated this at a 2024 policy meeting organized by Joint Admissions and Matriculation Board, JAM, in Abuja. Well, that's the news. Good Morning Nigeria continues with Claire and Ingeri after this break. Government of Nigeria wants vandals of national assets, electricity transmission towers, cables and other facilities to desist from this act of sabotage. Vandalism is a serious crime punishable under the law. Vandalizing electrical equipments will affect millions of Nigerians including your loved ones. Remember that national assets belong to all of us, hence the need to protect them. Report all cases of suspicious movement around electrical facilities to security agencies. When you see something, say something. This message is from the Federal Ministry of Information and National Orientation in collaboration with the National Counter-Terrorism Center, NCTC, Office of the National Security Advisor. We are live in the open market for Africa next challenge. My people, today now. Nah. Today, I will show you how the power of new Apic 10X gives your toilet a better cleaning than bleach. Than bleach? Yes, so. Impossible. Toilets have stains which bleach cannot clean effectively. But Apic is thicker and sticks better, which gives 10X better cleaning versus bleach and kills germs. Oh, wow. You can now see that Apic is better than bleach.
Did you know that a quarter of the world's deaths from malaria is in Nigeria? And the reason being a mosquito that spreads malaria, a disease that puts everyone's life in distress. We believe that protection and prevention is the best cure in the fight to end malaria. Mortine Insecticide with its improved formulation kills 100% mosquitoes that spread malaria. So spread the message of how we can fight to end malaria with Mortine. Mortine, our number one choice. Enjoy all the better moments with Go TV. Your football party, Go TV. They give you better deal of Decoder Plus Go Tena for only 19,900 Naira. Make you enjoy correct football action live on Top Super Sport. Go TV. Love it. The Council of Our Fathers. I will urge and advise our younger generation to use talent and brain to sort out problems, not uh, arms. Nigerian youths, let's build our nation together. You have to move from the point where you protect and defend your religion to a point where you also recognize the rights of the other person, of the other religion, and protect it. So if I am protecting my own territory and my own people and trying to emphasize their rights and protect their rights, I should also be thinking about how to protect the rights of the others. Both Islam and Christianity recognize and defer to God and both recognize the temporariness of the life of this world and that ultimately we all go back to God for the day of reckoning when everybody will render an account of his life on this temporary abode. Thank you once again for staying with us and good morning Nigeria Live from the network service and we are moving on to newspaper review coming up in just a moment. Having some technical hitches this morning. We do really, really, really apologize. Uh, they, some days are like that. And as uh, some mothers will have them, as we used to say. But let's welcome Chukudu Kudubaja. He's already here in the studio. Chukstu boy, good morning. Are uh, you? Good morning. And it's a good Friday. Glitches are a fact of life. When they happen, you take them in stride. Of course. It's a good Friday indeed. <laughs> Hello, Yan Ray. How are you doing? Very well, Chukudu. Good to see you. Same here. All right, let me quickly take uh, the, the papers. Uh, blueprint, reprieve as FG Labour settled for 70,000 Naira minimum wage. It comes with two riders. Why we accepted the offer, NLC TUC explains, OPS kicks, and uh, Tinumbu orders payment of Sanu and Nasu withheld salaries. And, uh, okay, the picture story, uh, Minister of Information and National Orientation, Mohamed Idris, and Minister of State for Labor and Employment in Kiruka, New Georgia, uh, President of the NLC, Kamari Joe Ajero, President of Trade Union Congress, TUC, Festus Susifo, all of them together briefing correspondent, uh, State House correspondents after meeting with President Bola Mechinimbu yesterday and taking that decision, of course, uh, uh, that has uh, brought down the uh, high BP for many, many people when we heard that story yesterday about the threats <laughs> to go on a one month or three month strike. Uh, yeah. All right, so let's other stories. CDS, IGP to reps. Our personnel don't protect illegal minors' minefields. Say we only guard legitimate minors. Okay, 
and persistent inflation may extend monetary tightening wounds could do so. Uh, so. There are other stories there on the front page. Uh, let's take you above the name plate. Reps cut down salaries by 50% for six months. And I, and, mm, okay, let me quickly, this is sports. FIFA ranking, Super Eagles drop as Spain climb to third position. Jam releases cutoff marks for 2024-2025 admission. And the New Telegraph, again, also leads with Tinumbo Labour agree on 70,000 minimum wage. Reduces a uh, period of review to three from five years. President orders finance budget ministers to resolve issues with Sanu and Nasu. As Labour urges government not to court major national interests. Uh, quite a number of riders uh, to that story. Legis executive and legislative romance dangerous for Nigeria's democracy. Artiku, PDP morally, politically unfit to point fingers, APC. Why many Nigerians can't die for the country? Uzodima says nation not merit driven. And uh, we have um, uh, gubernatorial polls, 246 applicants failed BIVAS accreditation test in Edo and Undo. That's INEC. And um, there are other stories there. Of course, we've talked about the uh, jams uh, cutoff mark and the age uh, limit. Hardship reps donate 432 million naira to vulnerable Nigerians as they cut salaries by 50 uh, percent for six months. Mm. Okay. And Ray. All right. Uh, let's uh, take a look at uh, <laughs> what the sun uh, holds uh, on the front page this morning. Uh, of course, uh, 70,000 naira minimum wage leads. Uh, Labour opens up on a great 70,000 naira minimum wage. And the rider, uh, we have uh, Riches Truce with federal government. Why I inter intervened? That's according to Tinubu. Kalu comments all parties. Uh, away from that, just uh, beside the picture story, we have universities, uh, polytechnics, uh, of course, uh, colleges of education fixed minimum admissible score. All right, that has already been mentioned. Mm -hmm. And we have Atiku accuses National Assembly of supporting executive recklessness. Local government autonomy. Senate moves to scrap CX. And airline operators deny media report on alleged indebtedness to lessers. And, uh, of course, uh, we have this one here um, at the bottom of the front page of the Sun. Tension over feared return of Shaibu to office. And just looking inside the Daily Sun, I can see a report here that says a policeman feared dead, others injured, as gunmen attack Okwebulu. Shaibu's convoy in Benin. We just hope that, um, you know, all of this is curtailed before the election. Chikudi. Why, yes, would, yes. uh, why would gunmen be allowed to uh, attack the Shaibu Pueblo convoy and the policeman died? I, I think it's even an inspector level, everybody's important, please. You know, a police officer. Mm -hmm. it's, 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 it's unfortunate. Mm -hmm. That's an indication of how you of what to come. Because yes. in, Edo, in Edo, you know, I, and I think that the the earlier you know uh, things are addressed quickly, uh, the better before the elections. You know, setting. Claire, it's a it's a big yes. point. Yes. Nobody is talking, uh, particularly the press, mm -hmm. but the feelers I got suggested that. Even during the local government uh, elections that happened in some places, you could see people who were called cult members pet, with weapons. And it's as if it's becoming something. Now, so then they do. No, it can't be. God has to fight evil, evil in this country. You know? So it's unfortunate, really. You know, I don't know why you that know, should happen. violence, uh, you know, like what we saw um, in the U.S., um, you know, against Trump and then what was seen happening here, you just wonder, when will politicians take this game of politics, take politics as a game and not a do or die affair? When are we going to get to the point, especially right here in Nigeria, where we can be, you know, preparing for elections or election day and, and we can go about our normal business without fear, without worrying that, you know, parties would want to 
you know, throw whatever it is at each other, you know, just in the, in the bid to get to, the, to that office. Then it's, you, it's becoming sickening. You asked a good question, but maybe the snag in that is leaving it to the politicians to dictate to us. It will stop when the people say we can't take this anymore and begin to punish politicians who subject us to this preventable or avoidable torture. Okay, Chukwude, there are three stories that, uh, I mean, with, without doubt, yes. drive You're the conversation today. You are smiling already. Today. Yes. No, 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 no. It does, I mean, it's everybody. <laughs> I was smiling. Go on, Claire. Yes, the, 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 the final, um, you know, decision uh, taken by NLC and, you know, the federal government. You know, yesterday, when the issue was raised about the threat to go on, you know, three month strike, we were all like, ah, please don't do that. Yes. But they've arrived at, you know, uh, a decision which, uh, according to the NLC, um, is acceptable to the organized labor. Uh, we say kudos to the negotiating team. Uh, at least we can breathe a sigh of relief that uh, in the next couple of months or years, you know, we will probably not experience any protest because the uh, the three five year review period was reduced to three years. What, what's your take on that? The 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 first thing is that the queue doors should go to every one of them, every one of them mm -hmm. really. The reduction from five years to three years as the time frame for reviewing, you know, uh, wages is a very good one. It was one of the palliatives, I, I have to call it that, that helped convince labor that this is something okay. we want to try. Okay. Uh, remember, I had, uh, you know, gestured uh, between 80,000 and 100,000. I'm, I'm, I'm 10,000 are short, uh, but definitely some agreement has been reached. And the federal government said, the CNG buses are going to come out as a particular, uh, you know, subject among the massive infrastructure you know, uh, work they pledge to do. Because if at the end of the day you give a worker 200,000 Naira and things exist within the polity, within the, the business environment, that will still, that will take 300,000 Naira from him or her, at the end of the day you have not given anything. Mm -hmm. It's very important mm -hmm. that that has happened. Okay, I, I, we're also looking at uh, um, the donation, or the, should I say the sacrifice by House of Reps by 50%, and uh, this paper gives uh, the breakdown. Yes, the yes, cost. it says, um, I think 400 and something 400 million. And 32 33 or 32? 32, 32 million. million yes, but, yes. But, but, but I mean, let's hear your review. Uh, before I say that, let us conclude what I was talking about concerning you know, the minimum wage thing. Government actually says they'll find ways of supporting the private sector to. Otherwise, it is a problem. When it is minimum wage, it becomes law across the nation. Because you're talking living wage. Anyone can go above that benchmark thereafter. The lawmakers have done well. Because if you say that the devil in the lawmakers take on pay is not really in what uh, the revenue mobilization and um, allocation mobilization mm -hmm. and fiscal commission gives them, but the allowances they give themselves, you would be right. But at least they've just have something. It shows empathy towards the ordinary Nigerian concerning what is happening in the polity. But so it is to be commended. Just, just like many Nigerians, and like I mentioned, I think earlier when we we're talking mm. about the sharing of rice, is how they want to go about these vulnerable Nigerians. Yeah. So that's one term that needs a lot of explanation in this country because uh, you know when you actually look out for the vulnerable and find out if they benefit from all these things it doesn't get to them so you you, you just begin to think that maybe we should just uh, take the word vulnerable nigerians away from our, uh, our lexicon uh, <laughs> and then look for some other things that we can do you know so if yes, there's if they're metrics, donating, yes other so ways to be able to reach out to people because everybody almost every, yesterday we we're talking about the uh, the uh, 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 dwindling of the middle class, you know, isn't into the vulnerable group. So, <laughs> a lot of people who are no, 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 no. Were, there are there know. are echelons of misery in this country. <laughs> I'm sorry to use that phrase, but that's what it is. There are people you take two mudu of rice to. And they almost kneel down and begin to shout. Uh, By the way, did you see the video of uh, your praises? A politician giving uh, a pack of spaghetti to. 
No, no, elderly I, women? I, I didn't see that. Oh, no. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's okay. we have just a minute to go. Chukwudi, uh, please, could you speak to the issues, uh, you know, one or two of the outcomes of jam policy meeting yesterday? The first one was, uh, uh, I mean, which, is, which everybody's talking about, the pegging of the uh, age limit for admission at 18, which is to start from next year. First of all, I've always said, what's the inferiority complex Nigerian parents suffer from? when they want their children to get into the university at 15. A senator, a former senator in Nigeria told me, Chukudi, why are you bothered about your children going to school at a... I always spent a lot of time in London. People don't do that. It's like starting primary school as well. I don't think well. it's inferiority complex. Uh, I Chukudi. don't know. Well, why, I, I, why I, the stampede? Uh, what, what is happening at the moment is the fact that um, children begin school on time or like you know, those days when mothers were always available at home. I have now, cited now, now, let me, countries let, let me where the reasons. rush is not that way. Let they me. meet a particular age. No, but again, yes. some people who are against this pegging of age will tell you, can we begin to peg the number of years you stay in school and graduate? So if, if you say 18 years, then you're going for a course of four years, you should be able to peg that in four years you actually graduate. So it should be at no, that no, no. point. Uh, I don't think there's really a correlation between it, them. Yes, there's a correlation because, see, because, see, you see, there are a lot of things um, that take a lot of time in this country. Some, yes. so, so, some people spend more than four years because I'm either due to strikes. It's, it's, it's exactly. That's, that that's, is, that's, that's, that's is what, what we're talking I, about. I, I that is not why that's they are. About. That is not why they are getting in early. Uh, uh, me and Ray, there is such a thing as in primary school. They tell you that the cognitive abilities of a child do not come best till they get to a particular yeah, age. Is that clear? I'm talking scientifically now. I have, Maturational I have, I have, period. I have been directed to, to, you know? to, I have been directed to conclude this But But, but, this but I have a quick question. Segment. I have okay. a quick question. Does age determine maturity? Does what? Age determine maturity. Oh, most of the time it does. I don't think there's so. There's a time for your, there's a period for your brain to grow and all that. Empirical yeah. evidence, Henry, proves so. Of course, yes. yes. It I would everything. like to see that in very cool evidence. You, because, you, because, you because, 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 because with the kind of things that this generation are exposed Ca to at okay, an early age, okay. compared to those... Okay, who, quickly, <laughs> my child will resist joining a cult in the university love, if he has managed to get to 18 to or 19. I'm he, not when he's 15. Not me. It's we, okay. We would love to have Professor Ishak. Hello, Hello Eddie. Eddie. That wonderful yes, man. Yes, wonderful man on Good Morning Nigeria because... Uh, from 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 what I'm getting from both of you, yes, it's going no, to be. An I'll idea. tell you, one forty no, over four hundred is not a pass mark. We are, we are happy. <laughs> we are happy. Thank you, Thank you, Chukudi. <laughs>
like a big dash as quite a lot house a big car mention a condition you might give someone in order to forgive them shower me with gift apology shall take me out <laughs> Great snack to have while watching a movie. Hot dog. Nigeria means a lot to me. And Nigeria means peaceful cohesion. My country. Yeah, we continue to pray and then hopefully we will come to understand that unity. Unity of purpose, unity of living together. Our ethnic beliefs and background and culture is our strength. Ever since the abomination period of uh, 1914 to date, about 109 years ago, the people of Nigeria live very peacefully with one another. I think diversity helps a lot to, uh, to enhance the uh, robust development in Nigeria. All over the country, you know, you have so many ethnic groups, over 250. That is enough to tell you that this is a blessed country and, you know, that God has kept, you know, together as one individual entity. This is still Good Morning Nigeria live on the network service of the NTA. And to begin our conversation on bridging the gap in the healthcare sector, let's uh, take a look at this background report put together by Oyeyemi Ajayi. Health is wealth, they say. Hence, the strengthening of the health sector becomes imperative. Challenges in healthcare of developing countries are many, demanding urgent attention and action. Nigeria is confronted with these same issues. Challenges in the country's healthcare sector include limited healthcare services, inadequate healthcare facilities, shortage of healthcare professionals, and a lack of essential medical supplies, and so on. Nigeria's healthcare also struggles with inadequate healthcare structure, including insufficient hospitals, clinics, and medical equipment. Rural areas are particularly underserved making it difficult for residents to access even basic health care. Financial constraints are a major barrier to accessing health care. High cost of medical services and medications force families into poverty and health insurance coverage is often inadequate or non-existing, leading to higher burden of infectious diseases such as malaria, HIV, AIDS, tuberculosis, amongst others. The exodus of medical personnel abroad has continually become a major concern, hence reducing the availability of quality care in the country. It is a medical brain drain phenomenon which many seek immediate intervention by government to tackle the issue towards strengthening the healthcare system. Now, what efforts are being put in place to revamp the healthcare system in the country? Guests already seated will be responding to these and more shortly. All right, uh, thank you, Oyeyemi Ajayi, for the background report. We have right here in the studio um, Dr. Francis Onhian Yudo and his Director General, West African Institute for Public Health. Uh, we'd like to thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. All right, uh, also joining us for the conversation, uh, but via Zoom uh, from Azare, is Professor Bala Mohamed Audu, the President of Nigerian Medical Association. NMA. He's also the Vice Chancellor of Federal University of Health Sciences, Azare, Bochi State. Many thanks for joining us, Prof. Thank you for having me, viewers. You can see on your screen. So we also have joining us uh, via Zoom from Abakaliki, uh, Michael Nachi, the President, Niger National Association of Nigerian Nurses and Midwives. Many thanks for joining us. Michael Nachi. All right, uh, and uh, also uh, via Zoom, and uh, but uh, from outside the country, uh, from Canada, actually, we have Dr. Itwa uh, Godson Irugwe, uh, the President, Canadian Association of Madrid Physicians and Dentists. Many thanks for joining us, Dr. Irugwe. 
Good morning, viewers. Thank you for having me here today. All right. Uh, thank you, gentlemen, for joining us. It's an all-meal affair in terms of our guests, <laughs> uh, but it's also an all-female presentation affair, so it's equation balanced. Um, we, we, again, we are back to discussing uh, how we can bridge the uh, gap in healthcare delivery in the country. And this probably, I would say, uh, is prompted by, again, the alarming uh, statistics coming from NME in terms of widening gap in doctor-patient ratio. And I'm wondering, maybe I should also start with the president of the NME Association, Professor Bala Mohammed Audu, uh, who is joining us from Azari. Uh, can you give us more insight into um, this, uh, you know, disheartening, if you may, statistics? Thank you very much. Um, let me start by saying that we need to focus on what exactly achieved in the Nigerian health sector. There are two fundamental issues. To deliver quality, patient-centered, respectable care, both in the public and the private sectors, on the one hand, and secondly, to ensure access to this quality patient care by all Nigerians, what is basically referred to as universal health coverage. Among other things, the cornerstone of achieving that involves both the workplace environment in terms of infrastructure, diagnostic, what is available for prevention, investigation, and for treatment. But very importantly, demand power for health, ranging from doctors, nurses, other healthcare providers, including community health extension workers, pharmacy technicians, and so on and so forth at the primary care level through to secondary and tertiary care level. What we have seen in recent years is a mass integration of doctors, nurses, and indeed many healthcare providers out of this country to more lucrative developed countries in the West, as well as in the Gulf states. These are mainly push factors that make them leave this country greener pastures. These push factors center around the workplace environment itself, as well as, as well as the conditions of services that ensure the well-being of these care providers. Unfortunately, the whole world will see a deficit in healthcare providers to the tune of about, I think, it by 2030, which means what's going to happen is that countries that can offer the best conditions of service in terms of both workplace environment as well as the well-being will compete at a very great advantage against low middle income countries like Nigeria. This would result in a dwindling population of healthcare providers, and in a country like Nigeria, vices an increasing population for the worsening 
the doctor patient ratio, which is one to six as recommended by the World Health Organization, but currently stands at about one to five thousand. And this would most likely be in our more in our, in our urban centers that have more proportion of doctors. This is more likely to be a lot more in our rural areas where there is an uneven and inequitable um, distribution of both health facilities as well as manpower. The exact figures of these numbers is very dynamic. But suffice to say that a large proportion of people, including Nigerians, who move out of their countries for medical reasons in developed Western countries such as the United Kingdom and the United States, and end up a lot of the time Nigerian doctors who were trained in this country who could provide and provided these best quality services to our citizens, but who have been taken up by other countries to provide services to their own citizens. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Audu. Uh, would uh, definitely get back to you in the course of this conversation. Uh, but we have to get to Dr. Iriok Beda because you have mentioned uh, the mass exodus of uh, medical uh, personnel uh, uh, you know, out of this country has been responsible for what we see in the health sector and, of course, uh, putting the ratio uh, at, at, at what you have said. So I'd like to find out from Dr. Iriok Beda, who practices outside Nigeria and a medical practitioner. We want to know, what are the push factors or what is responsible for um, you know, medical personnel seeking greener pastures outside Nigeria. Uh, you know, just uh, talk to us so with your interaction with those who, who get into uh, the country where you are and uh, maybe also tell us your own experience and why you are practicing elsewhere. Thank you so much again for having me. Um, I, I will, uh, you know, speak a bit about uh, what Professor Bala, uh, Bala Aldo just spoke about in terms of some of the motivating factors that makes people to want to migrate, you know, overseas. And, you know, one of them is lack of facilities, right? So you're a medical doctor, you train to provide certain services. And um, when you want to specialize, you feel that, you know, those facilities are not available. Sometimes you don't have enough openings, you know, for you to do training also. Uh, you also don't have enough manpower around you to support you if you decide to actually go into, you know, working in Nigeria. In addition, let's not, you know, run away from it. Money is quite important. You have to look after yourself, look after your children, uh, look after your extended family also. And if you feel that, you know, at the end of the month, the amount of money you make is not sufficient for you to survive and to take care of your immediate family, then you start thinking about going overseas, whether within Africa or outside Africa, to, uh, to seek for greener pastures, as we say. And uh, most of the people coming to Canada, I think uh, they, they fall within that particular category. People are also really determined to learn, to expand their skills. They want to be in an environment where they have access to, you know, first world facilities, first world uh, 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 experts, as well as the ability for them to navigate a system that uh, doesn't have a lot of roadblocks or bottlenecks for them. Uh, my personal experience is I left Nigeria a long time ago. I first went to South Africa, where I went and I specialized in family medicine there. And that was a very good training ground for me for a while. And afterwards, I moved to Canada, which, you know, that's where I, I am currently. And I'll tell you that the difference is, is really quite remarkable between the practice, what you have in South Africa or in Canada, compared to what you have in Nigeria. Uh, the independence you have, the facilities, the support system. Uh, the government provides that support for you uh, 
uh, here for you to succeed. I mean, we also have some concerns in the healthcare sector here in Canada that we wish that the government will really improve on. But when you compare them, right, it, you know, Canada is really, you know, uh, on a different plane compared to Nigeria. And uh, I believe that it's not the end of everything. I, I know that probably you talk about this later on, but I believe that there are mechanisms in place to sort of uh, repatriate some of these skills back to Nigeria to help the healthcare sector, to boost it, and to ensure that our colleagues working in Nigeria, they get the support that they need from uh, those of us that left the country, you know, many years ago. And a lot of us do come back to Nigeria to work uh, in various hospitals. Some have set up a lot of very, very world-class facilities, you know, in Nigeria, particularly in Lagos, I must say, and they are doing very well. And we have a number of them who are willing to actually come back to Nigeria to bring back those uh, skill sets, you know, that they've learned here in, uh, in overseas. Um, if we're talking about repartition of skills, I was fortunate to be in a meeting where the Minister of State for Health, Dr. Tunja Alausa, did a presentation in America recently, and he had uh, uh, some government officials with him also. And I must say that uh, the government has a robust plan to actually improve the healthcare sector in Nigeria. And they are looking at the diaspora, doctors, healthcare workers, nurses, pharmacists, to be part of that plan. And when you have people who actually work overseas, they're now working in Nigeria. These are technocrats, people who know what it takes to deliver a good healthcare service. Then you want to look at what the plan is and how you can actually, you know, support them. Yeah, I'll just stop for now. Thank you. Well, thank you. And uh, I should indeed say a very big thank you to you because uh, uh, you had to join us in the wee hours from, from Canada. I don't know what time it is somewhere around maybe 3 a.m. or thereabouts in Canada from where you are joining us. Thank you. You've um, uh, enumerated uh, uh, some factors, push factors, uh, learning, uh, expanding skills, you know, use of facilities, navigating a seamless system, uh, which is what is going for those who have jackpot. But I, I would also say uh, that some of these, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, themes are also um, you know, avail available here. If we talk about maybe facilities or even a, a system, a, a bottled system, uh, maybe uh, we could say, yes, these are issues that we could address. But thank you. Let me just put you on hold, uh, Dr. Uh, Itwa, and get back to someone who uh, has been wearing the shoes. And as we say in our local parlance, he who wears the shoes knows where it pinches. And that's... Uh, uh, the, the, uh, I mean, Michael Nachi. Uh, Michael Nachi is president of National Association of Nigerian Nurses and Midwives. Uh, and uh, like I said, uh, Mr. Nachi, you, you wear the shoe, so you know where it pinches most. How did we get to this stage where we are having 10,000 patients to one doctor? Thank you so much for this very important opportunity. I think it's a critical one. Uh, yes, when you look at the health sector and the attainment of universal health coverage and sustainable development goals, it becomes a critical situation in the health sector. The nurses, Kajira nurses and midwives, actually are the epicenter of these activities where it results. And the, the essence of healthcare is to provide qualitative healthcare that is safe and then accessible to the beneficiaries or the healthcare system. Now let us look at the Nigeria population, which is over 220 million. We analytically look at how many nurses are employed, who are employed, and as a result of the number that are employed, many are roaming about, but the those that are employed are overutilized in such a manner that in a particular unit, you may have few nurses that are employed, but they have higher workload. That even when we ask the government to employ, it is fully rather politicized instead of employing more hands. And we know that we cannot achieve universal health coverage and sustainable development without 
have an adequate number of nurses and midwives. To what extent are the nurses being taken care of? That is, has been an issue. There is no way you can talk about brain drain without talking about the push factors and the pull factors. Our other colleagues, the medical doctors, have made it clear that there are push factors and pull factors. Now, centering on conditions of service of the healthcare workers, all inclusive, the nurses are entirely at the disadvantaged time. Because if you look at the population of Nigeria at 220 million, you now look at the ratio of patient nurse ratio as provided by World Health Organization. That has become a total mirage. Talk less about the physical situation whereby you need to have at least one nurse to four patients. But all these things are mirage. So basically, we look at the conditions of service. Up to now, the government is just an address issue of conditions of service of nurses. Looking at employment, employment rate. So the policies that characterize the health sector actually need to be addressed. But that, that I'm not speaking on one side, the government in themselves are doing so well to equip the health sector. But such equipment are underutilized and then maintenance is poor. Equipment can be available, but to maintain it becomes another issue. Equipment can be available to utilize it becomes another issue. So basically, it is important that a good environment needs to be established. And this good environment requires effective teamwork. There is no health sector that can work without teamwork. The medical doctors are critical. The nurses are critical. The pharmacists are critical. The medical lab scientists are critical. And the, we need to work as a team. Without teamwork, we can achieve a little. And they looking at the health sector, every person is a critical position to need the help. It could be anybody, the nurse, the doctor, a relation. Now, if we are not working together, what are we likely to see? Nothing. The system will suffer. And for us to work as a team, we need to objectively look at issues that concern each professional group without dominance or thinking that the other professional group are not relevant. Every professional group is relevant to the sector. And what aspects need to be stressed. Nobody can clap, nobody can clap with one hand. You need the two hands to clap for anybody to hear. Therefore, we need to specifically look at teamwork because no one can do it alone. Any health sector without nurses and midwives is entirely a different thing. So when the nurses are forced to shift areas of greater function, it's not as if they cannot work here in Nigeria. It's simply an attempt to survive because after school, you need to do all that you need to be engaged so that you can help yourself, help the family, and help the society. And definitely, we all need to serve Nigeria that produces us. Even when people live outside the country, your parents are in Nigeria. When they are sick, who is going to care for them? Will you be able to take them outside Nigeria like the politicians who can afford it? So most importantly, the conditions of this, of nurses and midwives need to be address and then we need to establish holistic teamwork so that we can actually move then of course a lot of nurses need to be employed because many that are not employed are men taking private jobs that are honestly they are not getting anything and that is why majority that are not employed are living in nigeria in such a greener pattern Nachi, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, again, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Ohayido. Now, these are all systemic issues that we are all familiar. Um, but somehow, um, it's the, 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 the gaps are still there. Um, but what in your factor uh, do you think is, is uh, exacerbating, you know, 
uh, these um, gaps in the healthcare sector. Okay, thank you. Pleasure listening to the speakers, especially my good friend, uh, Professor Audu. I think uh, one of the things, let me start by saying that uh, if you look at the indices of Nigeria, you know, look at maternal mortality rates, it's in the 800 per 100,000 live birth. We, by 2050, will be the fourth largest country in terms of population globally. We have to be worried. And the things that have exacerbated our problems are in the character of our nation. Why I say character of our nation is that some of these things, other countries have been able to manage them, but we've not been able to manage them because a lot of the things that, that actually affect health lie outside health. Economic issues, political issues. If you don't have good political will within a health system, you know I mean, no, no amount of input you put in that health system will work. So it's in the character of the nation. And we need to, as a country, begin to shape our character so you can dovetail in every sector of our country. The same things that have dogged us even politically, the same things that are dogging us in the system. You know? So when people talk about health system almost like an isolated space, I worry because it means we're not connecting the dots. The critical issues are around governance issues, and I'll, I'll give you clearly. When you look at funding for health, the health sector over the years has suffered in terms of funding. And then within even that funding stream, the burden of diseases is a pyramid. And it's, it's a pyramid like this, right? Your standard pyramid. At the bottom of the social pyramid, you have most of the diseases that afflicts the poor in areas of squalor, where there are no water, you know, we are talking about even cholera epidemic, you know, and all that. So a light chunk of our disease burden, let's say 70, 75% are at the bottom of the social pyramid, right? Because a lot of other people who are upper class in, in terms of access to the things of life, income and all that, can afford to have the services that gives them some level of protection, right? But when you come to invest in the health system, what you see in Nigeria is an inverted pyramid. We tend to put a lot of money in tertiary, secondary level because of procurement issues. I say it's in the character of the nation. Procurement. People want where they make money and all sorts of things. Politicians, everybody, they want to make money. So they put money there and they forget that the primary healthcare system is where the bedrock of the health system is. An Obasanjo should be able to walk out of water farm 10 minutes and get treatment for uncomplicated, uncomplicated malaria in a primary health care setting of water. But we have not gotten there. Mm. Why? Character of the nation. Because people are so um, fixated on making money, enriching themselves at the detriment of the society. And they forget that if an accident happens in uh, Kaduna Abuja Road, with all this crazy road there, like we saw with the Minister of State for Labour, who had an accident there. Because the window of response time to get into good healthcare was not there. The man died. So it can happen to anybody. Nigeria can happen to you irrespective of your wealth. So we need to come back to the table and say, look, how do we make sure that health is in our policy, that we see health as the cornerstone of everything we do in the country? Because what I think COVID clearly showed all of us is that even with the high-income countries, you know, the health. way we speak, so I'm, I'm sorry to interject, yes. the way we speak, is, is, it's as if it is doom, doomsday for, you know, uh, health care uh, delivery in, in, in Nigeria. And, and I'm just like a former vice president of this country, you know, had cause to seek medical care right here in Nigeria, medical treatment right here in Nigeria, which is an indication that yes, we we do we could have our issues, but we do have facilities, we do have personnel. So why is it that you know these push factors or these young minds are going out? Is it lack of patience, which again is in our character? Okay, so so I was coming to the positive side. The positive side is that in every setting, you have entropy, what we call entropy in, in, in science, where there are factors mm -hmm. that play out that you can't even sometimes fathom how they play out. One of the things that has come in clearly is uh, technology, health technology recently has actually improved some of the opportunities to be able to drive an agenda for health, especially mm -hmm. in private sector, because they are tapping into that. The problem with health tech in 
public, public sector, sector is that people abuse it abuse the procurement processes and uh, bring some standard things and so 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 okay. you it's a way of those things they tilt in different ways mm -hmm. so for the private sector they are unlocking the opportunities so like uh, uh, my brother from Canada mentioned yeah, there are, yeah it there are facilities in Lagos uh, like mm -hmm. that are doing very well so but they private are facilities. yeah private facilities but they are outliers in a system and it is only for us to be able to learn from that. I'll give you one other problem, for example. We've had PPPs in private, in mm -hmm. private Pro public yes. partnerships mm -hmm. in health system in Nigeria. Yes, of course. Nobody Gar has Hospital, documented. Garike Hospital is a Beautiful. Product. Nobody has documented the outcome of those PPPs. We should be learning as a country. One, we don't have information. What has happened? How did they work? What were the good sides? What were the downsides? What have we, as a country, we need to be learning from all those things. We don't. So that's why I say some of those things are in the character of the nation. But there are positive sides, especially with the young people. One of the things my organization does is actually we work with the Africa CDC, what they call the Africa Health Tech Summit, which was in Kigali. One of the things we've been doing across Africa is actually to unlock the opportunities for young people who are tech savvy to be able to see how they can bring a common agenda to health. How can they bring low tech devices that can improve outcomes for people these people a lot of young people have so much talent in africa in the tech space so those are some of the things that are like i said the positive sides but before you get the bandwagon to create that critical mass it's a conversation that the public sector needs to also sit up and be critically part of it but the good side again for nigeria in terms of governance let me tell you up front there. Nigeria has never had, let me say, the right set of people, especially at the national level, to head this health system like you have now. Professor Pate is a friend, I know him very well, Mui, I know him, I know Kelechi, you know. So these people are astute people in terms of their space. They know it, they know what the issues are, but the, the structural issues and political dimensions of governance is what we determine how they're able to move. Talking about how, how we move yes. in the health sector, some people have also pointed at the budgetary allocation you know, for the health sector in this country um, as against the Abuja declaration of 15% uh, and what we see. For example, this year, 4.6% uh, of, uh, of the budget is assigned to health. That's about 1.3 trillion naira. Mm. And like you have rightly said, the bulk of that money is going to tertiary uh, health facilities. So how does this, you know, help? Or is this a step in the right direction, looking at what is being budgeted and what is allocated to primary health care facilities in the country? Okay, so the, the, one of the things we did, there's what is known as the National Health Act. And the National Health Act is the only law, the major law for Nigerian health system. And it was developed over a 10-year period with all sorts of challenges, all sorts of fights. And it was finally signed by, uh, signed off, assented by Jonathan Goodluck in 2014, I think November 4th or so, 2014. The National Health Act, our constitution, 1999 constitution, it was originally, did not speak to health. It didn't have up to a sentence on health, which was dangerous for our people as a, as, as, as a country with large population like we have. So that law help to define our health system and help to define some of the things we needed to do. One of them was a catalytic fund that was embedded within it. It's known as the Basic Healthcare Provision Fund. The BCHF is what Professor Patina is looking to use as a, as the, let's say, the leverage for his sector-wide approaches that he wants to put across getting donor funding, getting domestic resource towards Governizing primary health care because we have over 30,000 health facilities in, in terms of primary health care uh, this in dimension, but we, we don't have up to probably 25% per, uh, of them that are functional. So that's in itself is a challenge across 774 local, uh, governments. local governments in Nigeria plus six area councils in every state. So we have a challenge as a country. So we need to make sure those structures are done working. And one of the things, like I said, the Basic Health Provision Fund that is embedded in the National Health Act is a statutory transfer. The reason is that it's from first line, it's along with like security, so that people don't tamper with it. It goes statutorily for primary health care. And it's like a kind of a 
federal government's uh, this thing because it's one percent of the consolidated revenue of the federation. Federal government's uh, way of saying, oh, look, primary health care is the cornerstone of the health system. We must make it work. But even then, it says not less than one percent. The federal government has not been able to put more than one percent. Education, you beg, has two percent in that statutory transfer. Why can't we up that for primary health care? But there? some will want to put the blame on the subnationals, not just the federal government alone. So I'm coming to that. So one of the things that, that, that we're also saying is that for it to get more health for the money, for the Naira you put in health, we need to also track what is happening at subnationals, which is what you just brought up. And that is key. Because we think of governance purely in Nigeria from the center because of a system that has been probably um, bushwhacked by, by the military. So we're all about top down. But what about the implementation level, ground zero of governance? which is, even now with the local government autonomy, it brings even another dimension to this conversation. How do we get the local government to be more on board on health? How do we see them? Yesterday, uh, we were with Professor Patti at uh, Transcorp, the Universal Health Coverage uh, Summit with legislatures, uh, the legislatures of the country. And these are part of the conversations that came up. Now, this issue of local government autonomy, how do we track, follow the money? and make sure that they are also performing because they're actually more of the custodians of primary health care. So the money that comes from the statutory transfer of uh, basic care, co care provision fund is not a cure-all, it's catalytic. I know even by the time it's shared across the country, you probably don't have anything significant. But then the idea is a signature that we want to get primary health care right. States, local government, what are you doing with primary health care? We need to ask those All right, questions. That's a, that's a very important question, yeah. and we hope that we can get answers from the subnationals. But I'd like to get to Dr. Ariadne, and I'd like him to react to um, a comment he made earlier um, about um, you know, why medical personnel are leaving the country. You, you mentioned that uh, it's uh, for the sake of learning and interaction with experts. But we know from... Um, um, you know, records, uh, uh, what we see outside the country, that Nigerians do not necessarily go outside Nigeria to get um, uh, education, you know, medical education. They would rather prefer to get it right here in Nigeria uh, and then eventually leave the country. So it means that there's so much here in terms of uh, um, educational skills. resources and skills, okay? Our medical schools are working and, and functional. Our, our professors right there are still doing the needful. And we see that even when they leave, they're able to do very well. So uh, I want you to explain what you mean by learning and interaction with experts have been, has been the reason. Because um, there will be no need getting the education right here if, if we do not have, uh, you know, the education that is required uh, to do very well as medical personnel. Yes, of course. Thanks. I, I, will, I will try to explain that. So um, I schooled in uh, the College of Medicine University of Lagos, Idiaraba. And I can tell you that we have some of the best professors, best teachers in the country. And uh, these were people who, you know, a lot of them trained in Nigeria, but some also trained overseas. And we learned a lot from them. And across the nation, we have very good teachers right now who are you know, trying to make effort to ensure that medical students, nursing students, pharmacists, allied head professionals, that they are well trained. You are right in that. In terms of the basic training, we do have the experts there. Even when it comes to postgraduate training, also we do have very good consultants and professors, you know, who taught us. But when it comes to you as a, as, as a doctor, you've now qualified as a doctor, and you want to now specialize in a particular area, be it of sanguine, ophthalmology, orthopedics, you name it. There is a bottleneck in terms of how you get into the system. And there are a lot of barriers you need to overcome for you to get into that system. So that is where most of the problems actually lie, where people will now start looking overseas to say, hey, listen, I'm not getting younger. Um, determined to become an orthopod or a gynecologist and the opportunities are not here in Nigeria or the opportunities may be there but the facilities are not really up to standard. Uh, there is a difference between you practicing in Nigeria and doing what you can with what you have which is okay uh, compared to where you go to a country, it could be the United States, it could be in Canada, it could be South Africa, it could be anywhere in the world where they can do that same procedure using modern technology, using modern methods to ensure that, you know, the outcome is much better than what you can get, say, in, uh, in Nigeria. 
And I have examples of this, you know, so I'm not talking based on hearsay. My mom passed away in Nigeria because of poor negligence from a medical doctor. She was she, she was diabetic, but the care she received was appalling. If that doctor was here overseas, he would probably be in jail by now. You know, I'm a doctor and I know what I have to do to ensure that a patient survives here in this country. You have to make sure that everything uh, is done. And because you have everything that you need, you have the specialists, you have the facilities, communication, government support, everything is here. I'm not saying it's perfect, but they have it here available. But back in Nigeria, it's not really up to that standard. I'm not trying to belittle you what, uh, what is being done in Nigeria. People are using what they have to sort of, you know, achieve goals, which, you know, it, it's not very easy. You know, lack of funding, uh, lack of uh, sometimes government support and all that. And some of the challenges we mentioned already, they are also there, but they are trying to do that. But we cannot compare what we get here to what happens in Nigeria. Yes, we have the experts. We see some of them come overseas also for training. Some of them come overseas also, you know, to do uh, rotations in various specialty and all that. And they go back to Nigeria to use those skills in Nigeria also. So the medical school training in Nigeria is top notch. I, I really value my training in uh, in uh, in Medilag a lot. And I also value the experience that I have right now in terms of working in two different countries in South Africa and also in Canada and seeing the impact that has made in my life and also the colleagues that I also interact with. We all know and we all agree that, yes, our medical education is good, although there are some cracks right now in the world from what we hear in terms of the training and all that, but it is good. It's a good place to start with. When it comes to postgraduate training, it's also good. And if you want to go overseas, you can also go overseas. I'm not saying doctors overseas are better than the ones in Nigeria in a particular specialty. I'm saying that there are different levels of exposure that they do have and most of the time, those overseas, they have a higher level of exposure, and that makes them sort of better, you know, than, say, the Nigerian colleagues. Thank you. I'll stop there for now. All right, uh, uh, Dr. Itua, thank you. I, I really want to thank you very much for the points that you, you have raised, but also to say that, um, indeed, the uh, private... Uh, medical practitioners in Nigeria are doing quite well now, if you ask me. Uh, many of them now perform very complex medical surgeries, you know, that uh, when done here and, and the patients, you know, get uh, aftercare uh, at reasonable and affordable cost. Uh, I, I could go on and mention, you know, quite a number of hospitals, even the, the public hospitals, the national uh, hospital here in Abuja, for instance, you know, um, now has capacity to deal with, you know, uh, uh, I mean, very complex medical, medical surgeries. But the issue is, what kind of framework would you, um, you know, recommend, you know, to uh, be able to uh, enable, you know, our young medical doctors to remain at home and access some of these facilities, you know, in these private hospitals rather than jumping abroad to seek for greener pastures in Canada or wherever. <laughs> that's, that's, uh, that's a tough one because um, each individual determines, you know, what he or she wants to do. Uh, migration is a human, uh, uh, human right. They, they have a right to move if they want to. Um, but in terms of, you know, how do we retain doctors? How do we make sure that they stay back in the country and they do not, you know, go overseas. You just stated it right now. It has to do with the facilities that we do have in Nigeria. If those facilities are up to date, up to standard, and if they're accessible, people will stay back in Nigeria. There's no place like home, uh, I'll say. There's no place like home. But you're talking about private hospitals. So that is really like a top 1%, all right, that we have access to private hospitals that can afford it. It's not everybody, it's not the market woman on the street, it's not the shoemaker somewhere that we afford that can go to those hospitals to get care. It's not possible because they cannot afford it. So, and that's a difference between, say, country like US, Canada, or UK, or Nigeria, is that because we have, we don't pay for healthcare, so to speak. You can, you can break your bone, you can break your back right now, and you have the best facility to spend up to on you, 
and you know you will not pay a single cent from it the government covers your health care particularly in canada and all the provinces so there is a universal health insurance that we that we have here in canada but in nigeria i know they're trying to develop that right now you know that is not really available so if you want to talk about retaining young minds which i think is a good idea you have to look at some of the diaspora doctors people like us overseas and bring them over to nigeria and how we can repatriate the skills that we have to the young ones in nigeria so that by the time they graduate and also by the time they're already doing their residency and they already have the experience of those people who have worked overseas right there in nigeria then the tendency will probably be for them to stay back because there's this pipeline from the diaspora to nigeria that repatriates skills back to nigeria and retain our work in nigeria i'm talking about not just the doctors but the nurses the pharmacists as well as the allied healthcare professionals thank you if you obey, uh, we are asking you to come home. Don't uh, <laughs> wait for us uh, to come pick you. Uh, we hope that you take the next flight uh, back to Nigeria and, uh, of course, uh, do some of the things that you're talking about. But let, let's uh, get to uh, Professor Audu now, uh, you know, the president of the Nigerian Medical Association. Um, uh, you had uh, Dr. Rigby talk about his mother passing on as a result of negligence on the part of uh, medical personnel. You know, that's also another major issue in our health sector, because even when uh, you're able to access health care, sometimes the medical practitioner or the doctor or whoever, you know, should attend to you doesn't do the needful. It's a challenge. And then you heard, um, you know, Michael Nyachi talk about the fact that there are issues even amongst the professional groups and is causing, uh, if you like, uh, problems in the delivery of health care. Say a nurse uh, would say, oh, well, this is supposed to be my duty or that's not my duty and decides to walk away. Oh, a doctor should have done that or this and all of that. So speak around these issues as being, you know, also a challenge in the health sector and, uh, you know, increasing uh, mortality rate. Um, thank you. Let me start with medical negligence. Medical negligence is an issue that occurs all over the world and Nigeria has its own shares. The Medical and Dental Council of Nigeria regulates medical practitioners in this country. And any issue of medical negligence is directed to the Medical and Dental Council. It has an investigative panel as well as a tribunal. And it has the status of a high court and can deliver judgment on indeed if there is negligence. Now, this happens in every country all over the world. Like I said, in Nigeria, we have our own share of that. But if we look at the regulation of practitioners, what about the regulation of facilities? Let me take an example of the case um, Dr. Itwa spoke about. And I really am sorry um, that that happened um, to your mother. If you look probably at that health facility, did they have enough infrastructure and even good storage of information to handle that case. If they are on the side of the facility, there is no regulatory body in this country that enforces that. I'll give you another very simple example. I'm a gynecologist interested in gynecological cancers. I screen a patient, for instance, for cervical cancer, and I suspect that it's more than just a high-grade squamous intermediate lesion, that it might be an early disease. I say, OK, for me to be able to make that diagnosis effectively and give that patient the right kind of treatment, which would be completely a different treatment if it's an early disease from if it's a 
pre-invasive lesion. And for instance, I need an MRI to make that diagnosis. And there's no functional MRI in my facility, for example, where I practice in Azure because I know there's what there isn't one there. The nearest place would probably be made to that is in recent times. For some time back, they might have I might have had to refer such a patient to Ibadan. The patient would go there, there is a waiting time to get on the list to get that, that investigation done. But as we very well know, most patients will fall under the category of those who cannot even afford to travel out to get that care. So what do I do? Probably say, okay, the best I can do is to say it's a pre-cancerous disease or an early disease and just treat within what is available to me. But three, six months down the line, she comes with a recurrent fulminating disease that shows that my diagnosis was not correct because I didn't have an MRI diagnosis, nor was my patient ready to travel elsewhere to get that. So what were my options? To refuse to treat that patient because I do not have an MRI, to do what I can do, and end up with this kind of scenario. And if I end up with that kind of scenario, and the patient's relation take me before Medical and Dental Council investigative panel, they will probably find me guilty because I needed to do additional investigations that I didn't do, but they cannot find my facility guilty for employing me and giving me the role of a gynecological oncologist without providing me with the facilities to function effectively. So you see, there is a major gap here and we need to standardize, not just practice by practitioners, we also need to standardize the minimal room Requirement at each level of care to say this is a primary health care facility and define what a primary health care facility, the minimum it can do, the minimum infrastructure it must have, the minimum manpower health it must have, and the minimum requirements of what it must have for preventive care, as well as for curative care. It's not just enough to have that on paper. You must also ensure that there is a sustainable way to ensure that they practice those standards. And you must have that for secondary care, you must have that for tertiary care. And what we end up with yeah, the... Thank you. Uh, thank you. Let, let me quickly just, uh, you know, draw your attention back to the issues that you, your response to the issue that Dr. Itwa raised about medical negligence and really uh, that it happens all over the world shouldn't uh, be an excuse for us. I, I mean, it's high time we, we, I mean, we became an exception in, in, in that uh, area. I think what he tried to do is to use his mother's case, you know, to point to the distrust in the uh, 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 in the system by the people the question should be how can we build you know public trust in a medical you know uh, uh, system in a healthcare system yes i only illustrated that i first brought it out as a dynamic that happens all over the world so that people understand that it's not peculiar to nigeria then i try to illustrate to you what the gaps are and the point is, how do we now bridge this gap? I thought that is the essence of this discussion. We're not shying away from the responsibility. The point I'm trying to emphasize is its existence and how to mitigate the problem. So unless we identify that it exists and that existence is not peculiar to any country, then we can now address what are the gaps in our system that makes it happen 
and how do we bridge such a gap? So the essence of my bringing that out clearly is to show where the gaps exist and to proffer solutions on how to address those gaps. And the point I'm making is that these gaps reside both with practitioners as well as with facilities in which these practitioners practice. So we need to bridge knowledge gap, practice gap, as well as standardized provision of what is the minimum standard that every registered facility must have. The registered practitioners are under a well-recognized, highly reputable regulatory body, which is the Medical and Dental Council of Nigeria. But the facilities don't have such regulation. That is a gap that needs to be bridged. Uh, so many gaps to be bridged in the health uh, sector, and that's why we're having this conversation. We'll continue the conversation. Let's uh, take a quick break. We'll be right back. Stay with us. The federal government of Nigeria wants vandals of national assets, electricity transmission towers, cables, and other facilities to desist from this act of sabotage. Vandalism is a serious crime punishable under the law. Vandalizing electrical equipments will affect millions of Nigerians, including your loved ones. Remember that national assets belong to all of us, hence the need to protect them. Report all cases of suspicious movement around electrical facilities to security agencies. When you see something, say something. This message is from the Federal Ministry of Information and National Orientation in collaboration with the National Counter-Terrorism Center, NCTC, Office of the National Security Advisor. Meet lovebirds Jayola and Adama Davis. Their dream of living together as man and wife has finally been fulfilled. The latest couple in town, Yay! Mr. and Mrs. Jaya Davis! <laughs> but an invasion by their troublesome families was not a scenario they bargained for. Her mother moves in. His mother shows up with his little niece. Then her younger sister joins the scramble. Married life suddenly becomes very complicated even before it started. Follow their story on this channel as they confront every challenge as it comes. Family forever. The story of our lives. The counsel of our fathers. My advice to these young people is please uh, do not take us back to those harrowing days. You probably do not know what it is. Nigerian youths, let's build our nation together. You have to move from the point where you protect and defend your religion to a point where you also recognize the rights of the other person, of the other religion, and protect it. So if I am protecting my own territory, and my own people and trying to emphasize their rights and protect their rights. I should also be thinking about how to protect the rights of the others. Both Islam and Christianity recognize and defer to God and both recognize the temporariness of the life of this world and that ultimately we all go back to God for the day of reckoning when everybody will render an account of his life on this temporary abode. Welcome back. It's still good morning. Nigeria live on the network service of the NTA and uh, our guests are still very much with us. Uh, would like to get to uh, Michael Nanchi now. And uh, so far, our guests have uh, mentioned the issues, or if you like, the problems uh, in the health sector. Uh, but, you know, there are some recommendations as regards, uh, as regards the way we could, uh, you know, come out of all of this. Uh, uh, some have said the focus on preventive care 
health education and early intervention uh, could uh, you know reduce the burden on uh, medical facilities and if you like medical personnel uh, say for example education about sanitation nutrition disease prevention and all of that uh, speak to us about how we can go about this uh, you know just so uh, we can address some of these issues uh, I want to thank you so much for this very important opportunity but let me remind you of something I have observed I made my comments telling you about lack of teamwork for conditions of service on the employment of nurses. I'm surprised you never made any comment along that line. And you are talking on a very important topic, bridging the gaps in the health sector, Nigeria health sector. And you cannot look at teamwork. You cannot look at conditions of service. You are digressing to the area where certainly you cannot achieve anything without the nurses and midwives. I'm very, very surprised. So I want you to, yes, in as much as you want me to make an input in those critical areas, I want you to look at underemployment and the conditions of service of nurses. Because this seems to be an opportunity to say this, not just maybe hearing from me and not addressing such issues. Uh, uh, Mr. Nachi, um, if, if you were listening, if we are listening, every of our guests, you know, addressed questions and some of the issues we've raised, they were, were mentioned. So we, 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 we do not have to, you know, bother you, you know, to, to, to give us a wider uh, response. We know that these are factors. Condition of service is a factor. And that is why people, and I was going to say that, look, people are running away because of, you know, what they intend to get because of the pay. So if you, if you, you know, address the issue of the working conditions, of course, especially within the health sector, that would be a critical way of addressing the problem. So from your perspective, what do you think the, the government can do? What will be the right, excuse me, what will be the right um, uh, strategy to ensure that, you know, um, medical practitioners, especially nurses, you know, are, are better catered for? Because of the compassion I have for Nigeria health sector to work, I am seeking to have a good teamwork among the healthcare professionals. That will give us opportunity to actually utilize what we have to offer the best for the patients and the all healthcare consumers. A lot of things have been politicized when it comes to the nurses. And they lost on the nurses, the Nigerian nurses are made right down their tool for two, three days. That is the only time the government may respond to their needs. Over this period, our submission is before the government. But up to now, nothing has been done. We've been silent because we know that engagement in strike will definitely lead to loss of life. We have been so passionate about that because that loss of life, you will never know the person that is involved. And no matter who that is involved, it's a relation, it's a Nigerian. Therefore, that consideration has always been taken for granted and everything about the nurses has so much in their life. There's no Actually, if you, that you that listen, is, like my colleague already about. told you, if you listen to other guests, they talk about medical personnel in general. Not just nurses are affected by this uh, you know, condition of service. Of course, if you want to speak with a medical uh, um, lab technician, for example, they would also speak around these issues. The doctors have the same issues. Pharmacists will tell you the same thing. So it is around every personnel around the health sector, or rather in the health sector. So that point has been made. We're looking out for ways you know, to solve some of these problems. And so if you think that you know or you, you can recommend uh, a way out of this, we'd like you to speak around it. And then don't also forget that we're not just talking about this because of medical personnel alone. We're talking about it for the sake of Nigerians in general who are affected uh, by the weak, uh, uh, um, um, you know, health uh, system that we have in the country. So that's that's what we're speaking around. So don't think that your, your point hasn't been made. So I would still want to ask you my question. And I'd like you to respond. 
concerned because you're um, the uh, president of the National Association of Nigerian Nurses and Midwives. And when it comes to, um, you know, education, um, uh, getting the people enlightened about preventive care and all of that, you know, it's mostly in, 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 your, in, your, in your purview. So I want you to speak around it. How can this be a way out? Just so that, of course, if jackpot phenomenon is with us, we have nurses leaving the country every day, doctors leaving every day. So how can we look at other issues just so that we don't overburden the health system that is weak? It's all right. Thank you so much. We all collectively as that Nigeria is hard -tossing. What am I saying? Insecurity here and there. In health sector, there are areas we call health difficult to reach areas. The nurses go to the extent of getting to those areas. Sometimes become victim of kidnap. Sometimes they are killed. A lot of things happen. Improving the security situation will equally help. Then, like I have said about conditions of service, providing what is required for the nurses to work anywhere, any trained nurse is willing and ready to work anywhere in the country, no matter how long they are ready to offer their life. And that is the profession they have chosen to start humanity. So, teamwork is very, very important because. There is no healthcare professional that is not important. And I know very well that no one professional group can do it right. And that's why I say that nobody can do it with one hand. You need one another to work. Therefore, the issue about conditions of service need to be addressed. Identification of these problems and harmonizing them will help us to move forward. And of course, I have said here, the government is trying so well by providing equipment. But some of these equipment are underutilized. Some of them, maintenance is a challenge. There are some hospitals that you go, you will identify highly expensive machines. And you discover that that machine has never been used for once. And some of them will remain there and then become not only inserviceable, but they cannot be put into the use for the purpose for which they were secured. Meanwhile, they are all expensive machines. Yes. Uh, okay. So the government should be sensitive about what is happening in the Nigeria health sector. Nobody likes to be living to other countries because of anything. Like okay. I said, the parents of these people living, where are they? In Nigeria. And the, there is no average Nigerian worker that can afford health sector outside Nigeria. It is here in Nigeria. Only the politicians can afford to fly them, their families, anywhere. Therefore, if we could not address the issue of bridging the gap, which is critical in this discussion, Thank then you. we are not ready to provide the solution. For me, the nurses, the children, nurses and midwives are ready to work anywhere. They are ready to collaborate. Many are not employed. They need to be employed. Thank you very much, Michael. Actually, your point has been made. Your point has been made. Thank you. Because of time, we'd have uh, you know to uh, move to our other guest. Of course, my colleague here has a question, or I'm sure an observation about what you have said, and, and she's going to uh, uh, let you know that shortly. But I'd like uh, uh, Dr. Iriogwe to speak around the political will, uh, which um, Dr. Ohanido spoke about. And then, you know, like Michael is trying to mention, um, we have, um, you know, people seeking medical tourism, of course, mostly by the political class. How can we solve this problem? Would you think that maybe legislation such that, you know, if the political class get to seek medical attention in the country, that would, you know, propel them or, you know, bring about the political will you know, to get the health sector right in the country. Because at the moment, statistics uh, put it at uh, 664 uh, billion uh, naira, you know, um, on, on medical tourism, you know, uh, leaving the country at the moment. So speak around that. And of course, uh, I'm sure uh, Michael would uh, get the response from Claire. Uh, yeah, thank you. So I don't think, uh, well, that, that's a good option in terms of the political will. So the politicians, they should stay back in Nigeria and use the facilities, you know, that we have, that everybody uses, you know, that that's one option. But I don't think that uh, will actually solve the problem uh, in terms of developing the healthcare system in, in Nigeria. We really have to look at it from a very holistic point of view. 
yes, you're right. The optics will not the optics rather will not be too good for you to see somebody fly overseas because the person holds political office. That's what obtains right now in, in the country. We all know that. And Mr. Michael Nashi made mention of that, that's really the politicians sometimes who can afford care overseas. Um, even those who are rich also, they do try to do that. So it, we have to look inwards. We have to look inwards to develop the country. I've never seen even uh, the president of South Africa travel overseas for treatment. It, it doesn't happen because the capacity you know that they have in South Africa is able to look after the health care of its citizens from birth to death, so to speak. So political will is important, but political will has to be translated into policies, into laws, into legislation. It, it, that is where the political will is. It's not do not travel overseas. That that is very short term uh, measure that will not hold water. We've been doing this for many many years. I'm not an old person, but that policy has not worked. We have to look at the facilities we have in the country and look at how can we develop them. What sort of uh, equipment do we need? The primary health care system, like my colleague said, how do we develop the primary health care system? That is the bedrock of any health care system in the world. In Canada, primary health care is king. I'm not joking. The government looks at primary health care quite a lot to make sure that you know it is very stable and is steady. We have to look at the primary health care system. The primary health care system works. Then tertiary health care system, you know, you don't have a lot of patients going to tertiary health care system to seek care when primary health care system is actually quite functional. Look at retain, retaining uh, workers also, like what uh, Mr. Michael is talking about. What are their needs? What sort of gratuities do they have? What uh, sort of policies in place, uh, safety mechanism in place that they have, you know, hazard allowance. So there are a whole lot of factors, you know, that the government really needs to do to retain workers in Nigeria. My colleague here talked about the healthcare facility. Yes, look after the doctor. What about the healthcare facility itself? What sort of equipment do they have? Do they have the right equipment? Are they supposed to do this particular surgery in this particular area? Are they licensed to do that or not? Those Absolutely. regulations, they need to be in place. But Absolutely. we have to take it one step at a at time. A time. I, 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 I agree with you, Dr. Dr. Itwa. I agree with you one step at a time. And indeed, um, Mr. Nachi talked about or raised two issues. Please, I would like you to quickly, if you can, say in two minutes to, to just share your experience or the experience in Canada with us on the issue of collaboration, you know, between all the different unions involved in, in, in medical, in healthcare delivery. Um, how, how do they synergize, you know, for effective healthcare delivery? And then what are the metrics in, in determining the condition of service? Okay, so very quickly, uh, there is collaboration. There's also politics, I'll tell you, anywhere in the world, you know, doctors, nurses, you, you name it. But everybody has a common goal. We have to take care of the patient, patient centered, and politics falls aside completely. We collaborate a lot with our allied healthcare services. Without them, we cannot work. I'm serious. You, you can't draw blood, you can't, uh, the nurses, they take care of patients. So, it's, it's so intertwined that, you know, we see ourselves as one right now. And we collab, we have meetings together, we have seminars together, we share ideas together, we talk together quite a lot, both informally and formally also, so that we are all on the same page when it comes to healthcare delivery uh, system. If we do not do that, the healthcare system will collapse. There is really no, uh, I'm the boss, you are below me. That sort of attitude does not work here overseas. Everybody is on the same level. You respect them for who they are. They respect you for who you are. And sometimes nurses can actually correct you if you're making a mistake. It's not pride. You have to accept it and say, oh, thank you so much for that. And, you know, you do what you have to do. That's how it works here. So the collaboration is, is, is quite important in this place. And I hope that, you know, that we look at it that way in Nigeria also to see that sort of collaboration that it is all for one and one for all that we are all together in this to deliver a proper healthcare system to the patient and to make Nigeria, you know, uh, a better place. I forgot the second part of your question. Forgive what about me. the pay? What about the pay? Yeah, the, oh, yeah. The, uh, okay, yeah. So they have standards. Uh, I, I'm not, I don't have this on top of my head right now. They have standard rates, you know, hourly rate for nurses, what they get paid. Uh, doctors also, we 
we don't get paid hourly. Well, it depends. So there are two systems. So there are some people who are on salaries. There are some who are just private. So private means you bill the government for a patient that you see based on the disease condition. So some people opt for that. I'm in that particular section. Others opt for a salary system. The nurses, most of them are on per hourly rates. The rates are very, very good. Uh, that's why they come overseas. And LPN, uh, you know, registered nurse, I mean, my goodness, they, 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 they are well taken care of. And they can move anywhere. They can migrate anywhere within the country because they are in need, you know. So when people from Nigeria, they see that, I don't blame them sometimes, that you have such liberty, you can have a house, have a home, uh, that is worth six hundred thousand dollars, five hundred thousand dollars. You have a car. You, you know, you have access to so many things. You be attracted to. You know, you want to come overseas. So, the, the the standard of the of you know your pay, your benefits, it is set. It is non-negotiable. It's like a law. No uh, government official, anybody can come in and try and change that. You do that, there will be war. So, uh, the government takes care of all that. Thank you. Why? You know, a lot of people are in a hurry, exactly. uh, you know, to, to move back. to those other countries. And we hope that we can begin to see all of that being replicated right here in Nigeria so people can stay and, you know, be proud of their uh, jobs right here in the country. So I'd like you to, you know, respond to some of the comments made so far. And then you know, your, your recommendation in all of this, how can we bridge this gap and, and solve some of the problems in the health sector, Dr. Ohan Yido? Okay, so let me start by uh, saying that, uh, I mean, a lot of the points they've made are germane, and I'm very happy that uh, we have said this conversation. It's something that we need to do more as a country so that we'll have a focus on the key things that we need to leverage on to change the health system. But critical among this is the fact that the current uh, minister, the coordinating minister of health and social w welfare, Professor Party, has a four-point agenda. And this four-point agenda are around four pillars, and those pillars are around governance, um, uh, infrastructure, finance, and workforce. So you can see that a lot of things we've talked about here come there. Mm -hmm. Let me take the issue of, uh, of finances, so I'll just, uh, I, think, uh, I think those are okay. Health finance is very critical, that every Nigerian should get health commensurate with the Naira they put in health. But the biggest problem we have so far in Nigeria is the fact that most people pay from out, out of, of pocket. pockets. And uh, once you do out of pocket, the risk for you is that you can throw you into poverty. Somebody who, for, for some circumstances, the family head gets ill, and that's the breadwinner of the home, and they don't have health insurance, for example, and they end up taking the guy to the hospital, or the man dies, for example, or the woman dies, the breadwinner, whichever it is. That family can go into poverty. And those are drivers of even insecurity in our country. We have already multidimensional poverty. So one of the key things we need to do around the financing pillar is to make sure that health insurance works. Mm. So that even the, 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 the woman on the street who is selling her car, she have some modicum of health insurance. Mm. Even if any member of her family is sick, can get even a premium that covers like mm. even 20,000 Naira. You know, so those things are that. Then the other side of the health workforce, how can we reimagine the system in such a way that, because health insurance really is tied to this, because if health insurance works, now we're talking about mandatory health insurance for everybody in Nigeria. If we're able to do that, we will unlock private sector performance within the system, and there'll be more money in the system I, I, I for hospitals. And you, so you will now see that hospitals will be more competitive. They'll offer you all sorts of services. We need to make it work. We need to make sure that health insurance works, especially at subnational level. I think, Dr. Francis, that's a very good place to say yes. thank you. Yes. Uh, we need to make <laughs> the you know uh, our health insurance yeah. work. You know. All right. Uh, thank you very much uh, to all our <laughs> guests. Um, uh, we hope that uh, we find solution to some of these uh, problems that we have mentioned. So I'd like to appreciate you, uh, Dr. Francis Ohanyido, Director General, West African. Institute of Public Health. Thank you for coming on Good Thank Morning, Nigeria. Thank you very Nigeria. much. My pleasure. Uh, of course, uh, we appreciate uh, Professor Bala Mohamed Aoudou, the President of Nigerian Associa Medical Association. Uh, thank you so much uh, for uh, being our guest. Michael Nachi, President, National Association of Nigerian Nurses and Midwives. Uh, thank you so much. And I'm sure the welfare of nurses and midwives will be looked at. Uh, Dr. Itwa Gutsin Iriogbe, President, Canadian Association of Nigeria Physicians and Dentists. We're looking forward to seeing you in the studio. 
and seeing you, you know, uh, do something in our health sector in Nigeria uh, very soon. Thank you very much for being our guest. All right. All right, and that's it for Good Morning Nigeria for today and indeed for the week. On behalf of all the Good Morning Nigeria crew, the wonderful men and women behind the scene, I'd like to thank you too for joining us. I am Claire Adilabu Abdul Razak, and God willing, we'll be back same time next week, Monday. Bye-bye. And I'm Yanwe John. Enjoy your weekend. <laughs>